forces in motion. Okay, the first thing you need to know is the equation for speed. And you must remember that speed is always in meters per second. So you have the distance in meters and the time in seconds and convert it to that if it's not given to you on the exam. Remembering it in this triangle will help you to rearrange it. So being able to put the equations in the triangle will help you. You have about eight equations. You don't need to learn them. Don't spend a lot of time learning them. But you do need to put them in triangles and possibly rearrange them. This triangle works like this. If you cover over S for speed, you're left with D divided by T, which is this equation here. If you want to know what distance is, distance is speed times time. Speed times time is distance. And finally, if you want to know what T is, cover over T, you're left with D divided by S, which is distance divided by speed. Okay, you need to know all about distance time graphs and speed time graphs. The distance time graphs are slightly easier, so I'm just going to draw one here for you to have a look at and consider. So if you look at this first section here, you can see it starts at a distance of 0 and goes up to 10 in 20 seconds. Because it's a straight line, it means it's got a steady speed. So a steady speed from 0 to 10 meters. The second section is a horizontal line. All horizontal lines will mean that it stays at the same distance. So here it's staying at 10 meters, so it's stationary. And then this next section here, you'll see the line is steeper, much, much steeper than the first line. So it means it's a much steeper, it's much faster speed. And this last one, the diagonal line backwards, means that it's going at a steady speed still, because it's a straight line, but it goes back to zero, so it returns back to its original position. So here's a typical kind of question you might get. What is the speed during the first 20 seconds? Well, it's going from 0 to 10 in 20 seconds. So it's 10 meters in 20 seconds. So the answer is 0.5 meters per second. Second question here, how far is the object from the start after 60 seconds? You can look up the graph here. 60 seconds, it is a distance of 40 meters away. The third question, what's the speed during the last 40 seconds? Make sure that you're taking the change in distance, so it's going from 60 to 100 in a time of 40 seconds. So it's 40 meters in 40 seconds, so the answer is 1 meter per second. And the final question there, when was object traveling the fastest? You're looking for the steepest line. The steepest line is between 40 and 60 seconds. Okay, you might have heard of the term speed and velocity. Speed is simply how fast you are traveling. So a car here might be traveling at a speed of 20 meters per second. If you want to describe the velocity of the same car, you need to indicate the direction. So you need to add the plus sign on there if we're saying plus is that way. If the car was going in the opposite direction, but the same speed, although it's got the same speed, this would become a minus 20 meters per second. So velocity describes the direction as well as how fast it is actually going. Uh, slightly trickier, acceleration. The equation for the acceleration will be given on the exam, just like the others, but you may want to be able to put it in a triangle. So if you remember that we're looking at change in velocity and use a C and put it there, it becomes a cap triangle, easy to learn. And so if you wanted to work out acceleration, it's given there change in speed or change in velocity over time, and be very careful that the, the units for acceleration is meters per second squared, not meters per second. Um, if you want to rearrange it, cover over C for change in velocity there, you'll get acceleration times time. And if you cover over T, you've got C over A, change in velocity over acceleration. Okay, here's a second type of graph, and uh, I've drawn it so it looks the same shape, but it actually means something completely different. So the first section here, it's a steep, li it's a steep line going up from 0 to 40. Because we're looking at velocity, it means it's changing velocity. It's getting faster, and the special word for that means accelerating. So it's accelerating by 0 to 40 in 10 seconds. Um, a, a horizontal line here... On the other graph, it meant stationary, but it now means it's going at a steady velocity of 40. So during this period here, it's traveling at a steady speed of 40 meters per second. You can see the line goes up again here. This means that it's accelerating again until it gets to a maximum speed here of 60 meters per second. 
And then the line going all the way back down to zero means that it's decelerating. The opposite to accelerating means slowing down until it becomes to rest after 50 seconds. Now, if you're doing the higher tier, you may be asked how far this car has traveled during its journey. And what you must remember is it's the area under the graph. So you can work out the area of that triangle, add it to the area of this rectangle, add it to the area of that rectangle. Here's an exam question you could get on graphs. Well, how fast was the object going after 10 seconds? Go up from 10, you can see it will be going 40 meters per second. What is the acceleration from 20 to 30? Well, the change in speed during that time is 20 meters per second in a time of 10 seconds, so it would be 2 meters per second squared. What is the acceleration from 30 to 50? Change of speed goes from 60 to 0, so it's 60 meters per second change in a time of 20. So 6 divided by 20 would be 3 meters per second squared, and it might be a minus sign to show it's a deceleration. How far did the object travel altogether? You'd have to do it by working out the area under the graph. That would only appear on a higher paper. Okay, let's consider some forces. Let's pick a camel standing on a road. Why not? Here's a camel standing on a road. Like everything on Earth, it has weight. It has a force acting downwards due to gravity. It would fall down if it wasn't for the road pushing back a reaction which is a force which acts in exactly the opposite direction with the same force, means the camel stays still. What would happen then if the road was taken away, if that reaction wasn't there? Well, the camel would fall downwards. It would free fall downwards because there's nothing to stop it falling. Well, let's, okay, let's consider some cars now. This Mini here, if it starts moving, moving forward, because the engine drowned it forward, it will start to accelerate. There is no frictional force, or Aries is when it's going at very, very low speed. But as it builds up speed, you'll find that there'll be a force acting in the opposite direction due to the air resistance, due to the friction. So it tries to slow it down, but at this state, it is still accelerating, because you can see the arrow going forward is bigger than the arrow going back. Eventually, the arrows will balance out. They will be equal and opposite. So this Mini now travels at a steady or a constant speed. It needs to keep the force forward to maintain the speed, but the force backwards is the same size in the opposite direction. If the Mini now driver then puts his foot on the brake, takes his foot off the gas, there is no force going forward. The force going backwards brakes will slow him down until eventually he stops. We talked about resultant forces. These are quite easy. You just consider the size of the force and the direction. So this first person here has been pushed in both directions. You can see that this force is bigger by that one. You take one away from the other in this case, so the resultant force would be 400 newtons that way. If you look at the second person, you can see the difference is 100 newtons that way. And here you can have more than, f more than one direction. These two 700s would cancel each other out, wouldn't move left or right, but he would move upwards with a force of 200 newtons. And this last one, very similar, you can take the top force and the bottom force away, and it would be pushed up with a force of 50 newtons. That's what's meant by resultant force, the combination of forces. There is an equation that links force and acceleration. Basically, the bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. So if you look at these two sumo wrestlers, you'll see that the, f the one on the left is pushing the other one, bigger arrow there, he's going to accelerate towards the right. To work out the size of the acceleration, you can use this equation. Again, you can put it into a triangle if you want to rearrange it. And the force is actually equal to the mass in kilograms times the acceleration. So a bigger force for a bigger mass with a bigger acceleration. OK, we're now going to consider a skydiver, somebody jumping from an aeroplane. At first, he jumps out of the aeroplane, there's no air resistance. There is a big force acting downwards due to gravity, his weight pulling him down, so he starts to speed up, he starts to accelerate downwards. After some time, the air resistance takes effect. The air is pushing against him and trying to slow him down, so he doesn't accelerate at the same rate. Eventually, that air resistance will balance out, you can see the arrows being the same size, 
balance the force out so we reach a steady speed and this is called terminal velocity. He will not get any faster or any slower. He could get faster if he reduced the air resistance by tucking in his arms. The other thing he can do is obviously pull his parachute and when he does his parachute you see the size of this arrow is massive because the surface area of the parachute is big so it gets a lot of air resistance. This slows him right down, you can see the force upwards is bigger than downwards, so it slows him right down until he reaches another terminal velocity. At this point he's gone quite slow and he should be going slow enough, safe enough to land. So here's a graph of his motion. If you plot velocity against time, when he first jumps out the plane, he's not travelling at all. He quickly increases speed, a steady acceleration there shown by a straight line, and eventually he will reach what's called a terminal velocity. So the speed increases and he reaches terminal velocity, and then when he pulls his parachute open, you can see he slows right down, and he ends up at a slower terminal velocity, which is slow enough to let him land on the ground. And there he lands on the ground quite safely um, without any injury. If he was on the moon, by the way, there is no gravity on the moon. So therefore, you would just keep accelerating, keep accelerating, because there's nothing to try and slow him down. Okay, there's some more equations that you'll need. Don't learn them. Just know about them. And you will be given them on the exam. You may be asked to rearrange them. The relationship between weight and mass is that weight is mass times the gravitational field. And on Earth, it's 10 newtons for every kilogram. That means if you had a mass of 1 kilogram, the weight would be 10 newtons. So a typical mass of a person might be 50, 60 kilograms, means it's 500, 600 newtons on Earth. So if you've got the moon, gravitational field strength on the moon is a lot less, so you weigh a lot less, but your mass is exactly the same. Work done is a term for energy used when a force moves a distance. Another equation here, using the formula, work done is force times the distance moved. Remember, work done is a type of energy, so it's measured in joules. How many joules it takes to move a certain force a certain distance. Again, you can put it in a triangle, which will help you to rearrange it. The next equation is for higher only. And it's all about kinetic energy, movement energy. An object that moves has a certain amount of kinetic energy. The equation looks quite complicated. And the tip is that if you start at the end, you square the velocity, the speed of the object, multiplied by the mass, multiplied by a half, and it gives you how much kinetic energy that moving object has. And again, it's an energy, all energy is measured in joules. And here's the equation here. You will be given it on the, on the paper. You just need to be able to rearrange it if necessary. Momentum is a concept which is both on the higher and the foundation papers. And it takes into consideration the mass of a moving object and also the velocity it has. The bigger the mass, the bigger the velocity, the larger the momentum. So the equation is quite simple, straightforward. You multiply the mass in kilograms by the velocity and it gets this thing called momentum. The units being kilogram meters per second, which is mass times velocity. And in a triangle, to rearrange it, you would put it in this triangle here. Momentum is, tells you how hard it is to stop something. So the bigger the mass, the bigger the velocity, the harder it is to stop and obviously the harder it is to get going. So if you consider a lorry going at the same speed as a car, a lorry has more momentum then the car might have the same speed, but a lot more momentum is a lot more massive. It means it's much harder to stop, and it's a much more powerful brakes are needed. When you collide things together, the momentum before and after must be the same. And to demonstrate that, if you consider two cars traveling down a motorway, if car first car has a mass of 800 kilograms, and a velocity of 20 meters per second. If the second car has a slightly bigger mass and a slightly bigger velocity, so it'll catch it up and collide with it, then the two cars may stick together and will move off at a certain velocity. Now, to work out that velocity, you've got to consider the momentum of this car and the momentum of this car by multiplying the two numbers together. And adding those two together gives you the momentum before and that will equal to the momentum after. So here you go, this is for higher only. Momentum before equals momentum after. That is what's meant by the conservation of momentum. So the cars before have a total momentum of that for this car, 
and that for this coin, add those together, must equal to the mass of them combined, will apply by the velocity after. So quite complicated. You should arrive at an answer of that. I'll stress again that this is for a higher paper only. Um, consider the cars going into opposite directions. Same cars, same velocity. This time you'll see we've put a minus sign there to show it's going the opposite direction. Now you can actually have a look and see what's going to happen here. This one has more momentum. It's both got more mass and more velocity. As this one's less massive and it's got traveling a small shorter speed you can see what's going to happen here adding the momentum together comes up with that making sure you've got a minus sign to take one away from the other and therefore afterwards that momentum must be conserved to the same momentum afterwards divided by the total mass and you get a speed of that with a plus sign meaning it moves towards the right if they stick together um, common question you will be asked to consider how to stop a car and what factors will affect the distance a car travel while it's trying to stop. It comes in two parts. First of all, the driver will travel a distance while he's thinking about stopping. This is his reaction time. So you see something come on the road. It takes a little bit of time before he puts his foot on the brake. And things that can affect this are if he's under the influence of alcohol, if he's tired, if he's taken drugs or some other medication, and if there's poor visibility. There's, those will all increase the distance he travels while he's thinking, which is called thinking distance. Braking is all about the car, the condition of the car, and the road. So wet roads, drowned too fast, tires and brakes worn out, icy roads, the effect of the car, tires, brakes, will all contribute to a longer braking distance. Add the two distances together, gives you the overall stopping distance of the car. Bringing forces and momentum together, again, this is just for higher. Newton's second law of motion says the force acting on an object is its rate of change of momentum. In other words, to get something to stop or to start, you can work out the force needed. What it means is, if you want a bigger change in momentum, you're going to need a bigger force. And if you want to do that in a shorter time, you're also going to need a bigger force. The equation here looks complicated for higher, and it is one of the hardest questions you may well get. Back to cars. Let's use Newton's second law to explain how airbags work. Here's an example. So an airbag means that it slows down the time the driver stops. Basically, the change in momentum is the same, because obviously the car has to come to a stop, but it increases the time of the collision, and that time increase means there's less force. The same thing with seat belts. They stretch a little bit, so it increases the time, and also crumples in so at the start of the front of the car, increases the time, means there's less force, and less likely that you sustain injury. The turning of effect of a force is called its moment. And the moment's calculated by multiplying the force and the perpendicular distance. This equation will be given on the exam. The unit may not be given is in Newton meters because force times distance, so it's Nm. Moments can be either clockwise or anticlockwise. So in this situation here, we're trying to turn the spanner anticlockwise. So it's an anticlockwise moment. To make it even bigger, a bigger moment, more chance of undoing the nut, you can have a bigger force or a bigger distance, or even better still have bigger force andens. The principle of moments applies when a body is not turning when it's balanced. And for it not to turn, the moments must be equal. The anticlockwise and the clockwise moments must be equal. So you can balance the seesaw by adjusting the weights to get it just in the right place. So we pick an example here, if you look at the first row, if on the left you have a force of 5 newtons and a distance of 20 centimetres, multiplying those two numbers together gives you 100. That's the moment on the left, so to balance it on the right, you must also have the two numbers multiplying to make 100. And therefore 10 centimetres times 10 would be 100 and be balanced. In the second row, you'd have 6 newtons, so 6 times 10 is 60 and 4 times 15 is 60, and here is 6 times 12, and 12 times 36, and on this side, 8 times 25, and 2 times 1. The centre of mass is the point at which the mass 
seems to be or is thought to be concentrated. Very easy for regular shaped objects because it simply will be the centre of the shape. For irregular shaped objects, you may have done this experiment, you can hang it, a piece of card for example, for any point, and you keep hanging it and you draw lines downwards, a plumb line, um, and the line will always go through the centre of mass, so where the lines cross is the centre of mass. Why do we look at centre of mass? It's all about stability. So if you look at this hanging basket, which was an exam a few years ago, the weight of the basket appears to act at the centre of mass. If it is tipped to one side, it will then rotate back until it finds itself in a stable position here. So we're talking about stability. Look at this block. If the centre of mass is inside of the pivot area here, then it will be stable. If you could balance it, if you could get the centre of mass just directly above this point here, then you could balance it because you'd have equal amount of mass on the left and on the right, so the principle of moments would apply and it would be stable, it would be balanced. Moving the centre of mass outside of the base here would make it topple over. So body stable as long as the line of action with the weight lies inside the base, if it moves outside then it will topple over. So, so what makes a modern racing car as stable as possible? There are two reasons. It has a wide wheelbase, it also has a low centre of mass. So the centre of mass is going to be somewhere down here, and if you could look at it from front on or back on, you would see that, that no matter how fast the racing car went and how much of a turn it went, the centre of mass would never fall outside the wheelbase area, so it's very, very stable. The term centripetal force applies to all circular motion. So for example, a ball kept in a circular path with a string, there is a centripetal force in the tension of the string which keeps in a circular path. So if you think about other examples of circular motion, there is something pulling the bodies into the centre, which is a centripetal force. In circular motion, the body is continually accelerating, which is quite strange because there is no change in speed. The acceleration is due to a change in direction. The direction of the acceleration and the force is always towards the centre. So if you imagine if that force wasn't there, then the bodies would fly off in a straight line outward. Going back to the ball on a string, imagine it going round in a circle. The centripetal force keeps it in a circular motion, keeps it at a constant speed, but changes its direction continually. The force has to be increased if there is a mass of the object increases. If the speed increases, or the radius of the circle decreases, so a smaller circle. All of these would mean that you'd have to pull harder on this string. If you apply centripetal force to gravity, then gravity is the attractive force that affects everything in the universe. So for example, this Earth going around the Sun, because the Earth is moving at quite a high speed, but gravity pulls it towards the Sun, it doesn't get any closer to the Sun, it just simply moves in a circular path. In fact, it's not quite a circular path, it is slightly elliptical, so the force will change slightly as it moves close to the Sun, but the force keeps it in a circular path. All different planets have different orbit times. There is a pattern here that as you move outwards from Mercury, where it only takes 88 Earth days to go around the Sun, then Mars, and then Pluto, you can see that the time to orbit the Sun is much, much bigger. And that's because it has much, much further to go. And also it's because Mercury and the planets nearer the Sun travel at a faster speed. Two types of satellites, artificial satellites that is, geostationary satellites and low polar satellites have different orbits. You notice the geostationary orbits are around the equator. And this is because we need the geostationary satellites to always be above the same point on the Earth. So it must take 24 hours to complete its orbit, so it stays above the same point, which is very useful for communications. So satellite dishes are pointed at the same place in the sky because the satellite will always appear, geostationary satellites will always appear at the same point in the sky. Monitoring satellites move in a low polar orbit, so they can get close and they can scan the Earth several times a day and beam back messages for spying, for weather satellites, etc. Here is a convex lens, and either side of the lens we've marked the points F 
which is the focal point of the focus, and also 2f. So we start with the image quite far away from the lens. The green line shows a ray which goes horizontally and then goes through the focal point. This red line that we draw now is the ray which goes through the centre of the lens, which is undeviated. Where these two points meet is where the image is. And you can, in fact, draw a third line, which goes through the focus on the same side of the object, and that will then be refracted to go parallel on the other side. You can see these three lines join up to form an image. You'll see the image is formed between f and 2f. You'll see that the image is smaller. It's diminished. It's actually upside down, and it's also a real image. It's a real image because the rays of light actually meet at this point. Um, and that's how we describe an image in three ways. If we move the object closer to the lens, you'll see that the image changes size. At 2f, the image is now formed at 2f on the other side, and you'll notice that the image and the object are the same size, so the magnification is 1. Moving the object closer to the lens, you'll see that the image becomes bigger than the object, and therefore it's magnified. How much times it's magnified, you divide the the height of the image by the height of the object and that gives you its magnification. Move a bit closer and you'll see that it's magnified even more but when you get to F you'll see that the rays actually are parallel and therefore they won't meet so you can see the image is at infinity or it won't be formed. Moving even closer to the lens and you see to get the lines to join up you have to draw virtual rays backwards so you get a virtual image and this image is still magnified but it is now upright and on the same side as the lens. If we start with a plane mirror, plane spelled P-L-A-N-E, -E, means flat mirror, you always start by drawing a normal line, and a normal line is 90 degrees to any surface. The ray of light coming in is called the incident ray, and the law of reflection says that the incident ray and the reflected ray always bounces off at the same angle. So the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. For curved mirrors, we have either concave or convex mirrors. The concave, the way to remember is concave, cave go inwards, so it goes inwards as you look at it, and a convex mirror. A concave mirror, if you shine four parallel rays of light on, they will all be reflected such that their angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, and you'll find that they'll all meet at a point, and this point is called the focus or the focal point. For convex mirror, the rays will diverge, they'll move apart, and therefore they won't meet at a point, so you have to draw an imaginary ray lines backwards to find a virtual focal point behind the mirror, virtual because they're not really focused there. So a concave mirror is called a converging mirror, and a convex is called a diverging mirror, because that's what they do to light. Um, to form an image, there are three basic rules. So if we look at a concave, the three basic rules are that you draw a ray from the top of the object, parallel to the mirror, and you know that that will be reflected and go through the focal point. The second ray is from the top down to the middle of the mirror, and that will be reflected and joined there. And the third line goes through the focus, and because it goes through the focus, it will then be reflected and come back parallel to the original ray. And this is where the image is formed. To describe the image, you do three things. You look to see if it's real or virtual. In this case, it's real. It can be projected on a screen. Is it upside down or upright? In this case, it's an upside down image. And as you can see from the diagram, it's a smaller than the object, so it's diminished. The magnification is how much times bigger the image is compared to the object. Or if it's less than one, it means the image is actually smaller than the object. And it can be worked out by this equation. So you simply measure the image height divided by the object height. So if the image was twice as big as the object, then the magnification would be two, meaning two times bigger. Refraction is where light changes direction. And the reason it changes direction is it will slow down or speed up. So in the case of a glass block, if light goes through air into glass, it will actually slow down. And this slowing down makes the light bend towards the normal. As it emerges from the glass into the air, it will bend away from the normal. And this is called refraction. Um, a prism, which is a triangle piece of glass, 
bends it quite different, slightly differently. When it emerges, it bends further away from the normal, and therefore what happens is that the light is split, the light is dispersed, and the white light splits into the seven different colours. And this is because violet light is refracted more than red light. Okay, let's look at how refraction is used by humans in our eye. Our eye has a lens, and refraction happens in the lens. So here's a diagram of the eye. You can see that rays of light that come in are refracted by the, the front of the eye, by the actual cornea and the lens itself, and focused on the back of the eye, and the back of the eye here is the retina, and it forms a real image on the back of the retina, which then sends a signal to the brain. Two different types of lenses, there are converging and diverging lenses. Converging lens is also known as a convex lens, and it's thickest at the centre. As a diverging lens, is also known as a concave, and it's thinnest. Let's have a look at ray diagrams for these two lenses. First of all, the convex lens, shining parallel rays of light, just like we have in our eye, will focus the rays at a point, at a focal point called a focus, and this is a real focus. For a concave lens, it acts very much like a convex mirror, where the rays of light are diverging, they, they're spread apart, and therefore they won't meet at a point. So you've got to come backwards and find the focal point behind, which means it's a virtual image is formed. So a convex lens is often called a converging lens, and a concave lens is often called a diverging lens, because that's what they do to the light rays. Okay, how can we use these lenses? Well, people with short sight, what happens with people with short sight, it means the lens is actually focusing too early. It's not focusing on the retina. So we need to make the rays of light spread apart a little more. So by adding a concave lens, this will correct short sight, and therefore the image will form correctly on the retina. For long-sighted people, you'll see that the rays actually meet behind or would meet behind the retina and to put this right we use a convex lens and the convex lens will bring them to a focus earlier or uh, less distance and therefore they'll focus on the retina and that will correct long-sighted people this slide is going to show you how you can form an image with a convex lens although there is a further video showing it quite complex how the different images are formed the next video in this series so quite simply, if you apply the rules as before, draw a ray of light parallel from the top of the object, it will go through the focal point. The second ray to draw is one which goes straight through the middle of the lens, which is undeviated. And if you wish, you can draw a third one through the focal point on the same side as the object, and that will go parallel and those three rays will meet. So this image will be formed where the rays meet. And again, you describe the image in three ways. For this one, it's real. Again, it can be projected on a screen. The, the light rays actually do meet there, so it's real. It is upside down, and as you can see, it's smaller. There are lots of different images, so you need to watch the next video to see how different images are formed. And finally, a couple of applications. Cameras use convex lenses, and as you pr can probably imagine, the image has to be much smaller than the object, and therefore, the lens arrangement is such that the object must always be beyond 2f, and therefore you can't focus in on very, very close objects. For a magnifying glass, the arrangement is shown in the diagram. A magnifying glass uses a convex lens to get a virtual image. We can look at sound waves on a device called an oscilloscope. This displays the waves as a transverse wave. There's two th features of the wave. The height of the wave, which is its amplitude, and how many waves there are in a specific time, which is called a frequency. So if it's not very tall from the middle to the top, it's got a low amplitude, and this means it's a quiet sound. And if there aren't many waves, here there are only two complete waves, then it has a low frequency. It doesn't have many waves per second. And the second one, it might be still quiet, the same height, but it's twice as many waves, and therefore it's a higher frequency. In fact, it's twice the frequency. And for the third one here, you can see we've increased the amplitude, the size of it, so it's a much louder sound, but it's the same frequency as number one, quite low. And then number four shows you what would happen if we increased the amplitude and the frequency. We'd get a very loud and high frequency sound, high pitched sound. 
This slide's going to show you how sound travels, but first of all, just remember that how sounds are formed. They're formed when something vibrates, because sound waves are, in fact, just vibrations in the air. The fact you need to learn is that humans can hear frequencies between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So if you've got something to vibrate, for example, an uh, electric guitar, um, pluck the strings, produce a sound, and this makes the air vibrate around it, and here's a model of what the air molecules look like. So if you focus on one of the black dots, you'll see that they're not moving from left to right, which at first appear to be. They are, in fact, vibrating about a central point. And it does appear that things are moving from left to right, but it's actually just the vibration being passed on as a sound wave. Um, and this is how sound travels through air. Sound must have something to vibrate, so it cannot travel through a vacuum. And its sound actually travels better through solids and liquids than through air because the molecules are closer together. So when the vibration gets to the end to the ear, it makes the eardrum vibrate, and we won't go into the biology of it, but that eventually sends a signal to the brain. Okay, if you go beyond what humans can hear, beyond 20,000 hertz, then you get into a region called ultrasound. And ultrasound has a few uses, basically on the same concepts. We start with prenatal scanning, which is probably the most popular exam question. And I'll talk about scanning in the next slide. Um, cleaning, where the very high frequency vibrations will be used to dislodge the dirt, to make the dirt vibrate and fall off and also detecting flaws and cracks, and also medical treatment. If we concentrate on the scanning, the prenatal scanning, or the detecting cracks, this is the principle. If you send ultrasound through a solid, goes quite well through a solid, it will reflect off different surfaces by different amounts. And by doing this and looking at it and analysing where it's reflected, you can develop a picture of what's on the inside. So, for example, if it's an unborn baby, in the womb, then you can send ultrasound quite safely, bounce off the baby's body, and you can get a clear picture of how the baby, baby's lying and the features of the baby. Electricity, both static electricity and current electricity. So we start with static electricity. Static means still, so it means charges that are not moving. And to get that, we can do it by friction. So here you've got two different methods. What you can do is rub a cloth against the rod, and what may happen is electrons will be transferred from the rod to the cloth, leaving the cloth as a minus charge, because it's got more electrons, and the rod as positive. Remembering that it's only electrons that are free to move, and electrons are minus, so they move from one to the other. And you, other ways, if it, for different materials, the electrons may rub from the cloth to the rod, leaving the rod with a minus charge, and the cloth with a positive. You'll see that they've got equal and opposite charges. Um, things happen in everyday situations. Static electricity is caused by friction, by rubbing. Basic law of electrostatics, it's quite simple. Opposites attract, so the rods at the top would be pulled, drawn towards each other with an opposite force. And if they were the like, the same charge is both minus, then you'd see them repel, push each other apart. Same would happen with two positives. A Van de Graaff generator, I'm sure you've all seen one. This is how it works. The, the rubber cord rubs around here and causes static electricity by rubbing. And what you see is a buildup of charge. So in this case, we've got a buildup of positive charge here. If it's connected to the Earth, then electrons, which are free to move, will move up here and will discharge the Van de Graaff generator. If that is done quite quickly, then you may well see a spark, you may get an electric shock that goes through your body. You need to know about uses and dangers of static electricity, so here's one, and then you can apply it to the rest. Small precipitators, so imagine this is the big cooling towers that you see next to power stations. Power stations produce a lot of smoke, which has dust particles. So when the dust particles of smoke rise up, which is basically just water vapor but with dust, if you've got the charged plates on the side, they will attract the positive charges because we're going to charge up the dust particles with the opposite charge. So as the dust rises up, the positive dust suit will be attracted to the side, be drawn towards it, 
and the water vapour will go straight through the cooling tower, means that what's coming out the chimney is just pure water vapour, which is not damaging the environment, and then you can clean the soot off the side of the charge plates. So we're using static electricity in action here. Basically, the opposites attract and we can put to use. Other uses are photocopiers, where the paper is charged up with the right charge and the ink the opposite charge, so it sticks to the right part of the paper. And same with paint spraying, for example, spraying car bodies. Car bodies are usually made of metal, so if you charge that up with one charge and then the paint particles with an opposite charge, then it will spray onto the car body. Electricity is also dangerous in a few situations. Fuel pipes, static electricity can cause sparks, and if the spark is caused where there's a potential danger because it's fuel or gas, then you could get an explosion. So it's important that when you refuel in your car or refuel in your aeroplanes, that there is no chance of any static electricity buildup producing a spark which could cause an explosion. And in hospitals also, you don't want static electricity to interfere with the equipment. Going on to current electricity, you need to be familiar with these 12 circuit symbols. So quickly going through them, we've got a cell which you must have to get a current. Adding two cells or more together makes a battery, a battery of cells. You need to connect them up with leads and you also then can get a bulb to light. Often you put a switch in the circuit so you can turn it on and off. Now this one here is a resistor, which is going to come on more, so the rectangle represents a resistor. The next three components are types of resistor. So this one is a variable resistor with the arrow through there, means you can change the resistance. This one, which is again the resistor symbol but with a line through like that, is a thermistor. Therm meaning heat, so it's a resistor that depends on heat. And the last one is called an LDR resistor with arrows coming in to represent light, so it's a light-dependent resistor. More light on it changes the resistance. To measure electricity, the current, we use an ammeter, capital A in the middle, and we can also use the power or the voltage measured with a voltmeter. And a few of the components I'll come on to in a minute is a diode and also a fuse. Be familiar with those circuit symbols. In a traditional circuit, here's a very, very simple circuit, a battery here and a bulb, complete circuit, complete loops so the current can flow. What actually happens in the circuit is electrons which are negative come from the negative uh, terminal and they will flow around the circuit carrying energy to the bulb and that energy is then turned into heat and light um, which is given off by the bulb. The electrons then go back to the cell, to the battery and collect more energy and that produces a circuit, which means the bulb is always lit until the circuit is broken. So although we've got electrons going from minus to positive, by convention, we talk about current going from positive to negative. OK, here's some basic ideas when considering circuits. We can measure the electric current. Current is measured with an ammeter, and current is measured in amps or amperes. Capital A there, because it's somebody's name, Ampere, Mr. Ampere, so you must use a capital letter. Same with potential difference, which is also called voltage. You might be familiar with voltage, but you may see the term potential difference on an exam. It is the same as voltage, and it's measured with a voltmeter and measured in volts, and it's named after here, Mr. Voltar. So again, capital letter. The third quantity is that of resistance which again is named after scientist George Ohm. And the symbol is the omega, the Greek letter there, which is capital Greek letter there, to represent ohms. That's how much resistance or opposition there is to electric current. So let's take a look at some simple circuits. Here's a cell and a bulb. The bulb will light. What would happen if you had two cells? Well, you could represent it here. More light, more energy would come off because you've got more energy given to the bulb. So the idea is here that if you add more batteries or more cells together, you get more force, you get more energy, you get brighter bulbs. What happens if you add more than one bulb then? If you've got two bulbs in series, and a series circuit means it's all in one loop, then it's got the current has got to go through two bulbs. So it's got to share its energy out between the two. It sees what's called more resistance, and that resistance means there's less current. So let's look at that in more detail. 
if a series circuit like this, if you've got two amps flowing through the circuit here, that two amps is going to go through that bulb, through that bulb, and back, and you've just got one complete loop. Now, like a lot of laws in science, you can't lose current. There's conservation of current. So it doesn't matter where you measure the current in this circuit, it will always be two amps. It doesn't matter where you put that ammeter. So the, circuit, the current is always the same. If you look at the current in a parallel circuit, so parallel circuits look like this, the bulbs here, that bulb and that bulb are parallel to each other, then what happens is the current will be divided up. So here comes the current. It gets to this bit. Half will go that way and half will go that way. So the current here divides in two, and so the bulb gets equal amount of current. You can get more current. Let's have a look at three bulbs. If you put a value on it here, if there were six amps coming down here, that would get two, that one would get two, and that one would get two. And then when all of those currents join up again to go back to the battery, obviously you will get the six amps there, and that six amps will go back through the cell. Let's have a look at voltage or potential difference now, measured with a voltmeter. Voltmeter is always put in parallel. This is parallel to the battery, so if it tells you it's 6 volt battery, it's telling you the voltage across the battery. If you've got bulbs in series, 3 in series here, and they're identical, you've got 6 volts. I'm sure you've guessed it, that each one would share the voltage, and the voltage would be 2 volts, 2 volts, 2 volts, to add up to 6. If the voltmeter went across two bulbs, because that's two and that's two, you add together, that voltmeter would read four volts. Okay, and if we look at voltage in a parallel circuit, when two bulbs are put across each other in parallel, you can see they're both connected directly to the battery. So the rule here is that both those voltmeters would read four volts, not divide it up this time. They both get four volts each. So in summary, in a series circuit, the current is the same at any point, but the voltage will be split up over each component in that series circuit. In a parallel circuit, it's the current that splits up, but the voltage stays the same. Worth remembering these two simple rules. Okay, moving on to resistance. Resistance is how much it resists or how much it opposes the current. So the higher the resistance, the more it tries to slow down or stop the current. It's measured in ohms. So a higher amount of ohms means more resistance and less current. Here's Ohm's law equation. Resistance can be worked out by how much voltage there is per current. Again, coming back to our equations here, nice easy one to remember, VCR, you've heard of VCRs before, will help you rearrange it, making sure you've got the units correct. So here's an example of an exam question. So if this voltmeter is reading 10 volts, and the current in the circuit, going around this circuit, is 2 amps, then the resistance of this bulb would be 10 divided by 2, 10 volts divided by 2 amps, would that, res that bulb there would be a 5 ohm resistor. And in total, you'd be 5 plus 5 plus 5. You'd have a resistance of 15 ohms. Okay, a few more components then. We've talked about bulbs, we've talked about resistors, and this one is called a diode. There's an arrow here showing that a diode is a bit like a valve, where it only allows current thrown that direction and it won't allow it going back the opposite direction. If we measured the current and the voltage for each one, then for a resistor, they are proportional. So if you double the voltage, you'll get double the current, which makes sense. For a bulb, it tries to do the same, but as you get more current through it, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the atoms vibrate around more, and what actually happens is this causes more resistance. So you don't get the straight line, you get a curve. It doesn't matter which way around the current is, and you get less current than you might expect because of the temperature effect. And a diode, you'll see the line here, when it's in the wrong direction, you get zero current. And when it's in the right direction, you will get a current going through it. So a diode allows current going one direction and prevents it going in the opposite direction. Two more components was mentioned in the circuit symbols. LDRs, reminder, stands for light dependent resistor. And a thermistor, thermine heat, ister resistor, meaning a heat dependent resistor. So if we look at the graphs of how resistance varies with the amount of light. For an LDR, if you put more light 
If it's brighter, the resistance goes down. So giving it more energy makes it conduct better, means it's less resistance. And it's the same with the thermistor, but it's temperature that it's dependent on. Higher temperatures means you'll get more current, means you get less resistance. It resists less, so you get a higher current. Quickly on to DC and AC. DC stands for direct current. This is what you get from batteries and cells. So the current and the voltage is just one way. AC means alternating, means it changes direction. And for our mains in Britain, the frequency is 50 hertz. So that means you get one complete wave every 50th of a second, meaning in one second you have 50 waves. You can see the current here is going in one direction, it's positive, and then this, when it goes below the line, it's going in the opposite direction. And in Britain, it's 230 volts, our mains, which is standard. If you want to analyze and look at AC, you can use an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope screen looks like this, and you have two settings. The first setting tells you what the voltage is, and that's the vertical, how high it goes, the higher it goes, the more voltage it is. And the second setting tells you the time. So if I plot a graph like this showing the AC, what is the voltage and frequency of this supply? So you count the squares up. You've got one, two, three, four squares up on a setting of one means that you've got four squares, one volt, so it'll be four volts. From there to there is four volts, and it goes minus four volts that way. And if you look across, you'll see that one complete wave is one, two, three, four, five, ten squares along. So ten squares for 0.2 volts for every square means you've got two seconds for one wave. So if you get one wave in two seconds, it means you get half a wave per second. And here's another wave. If you looked at that on the same settings, that would only be three volts. And you've got two waves now in the same time. So it would be half the time for one wave and therefore double the frequency. So you'd get two waves in two seconds. So it would be one wave per second. Common question, and please remember this, if you ever want to wire a plug, you must remember the colours. The earth wire here is the green and yellow stripes, connect the top. The blue wire is the neutral wire. You have a insulation here, everything must be insulated to stop electric shocks. The live wire is coloured brown, is connected to the fuse, because that carries all the current. And you have make sure that you have a good cable grip to stop the cable falling out. You must remember those colours. The neutral wire is where the electricity returns, and the live wire is where the electricity goes into the device. A little bit about fuses here. These are the fuses here, connect the live, as I said in the last slide. Fuses are safety devices. They are there, they're not used unless there's a problem. If there was a problem and a very large current flows, then the fuse would melt, because inside the fuse is a tiny, thin wire. So a 5 amp fuse is thin, meaning that if 5 amps goes through it, it will get so hot it will melt and it will break the circuit to protect the appliance. You can work out the fuse by working out the power. Power of device is worked out PVC. PVC, I'm sure you've seen and heard of. Can, you can remember that and rearrange that. If you want to work out the current from power, you can do it like this. Toaster. Typical power rate, 960 watts. So you divide that by that, it gives you 4 amps. Now if you had a 4 amp device, you would choose the next fuse up. Fuses come in sizes 3, 5 and 13. So you'd go at the next one up, which is 5 amps. Meaning if there was a fault on the toaster, and this 4 amp went up to 5, because there's a fault, the fuse would melt and make it safe. So you can go through this table and see that divided by that is equal to that then you always go the next fuse up. Energy and power. How is energy related to power? Well, power is how much energy there is per second. So one watt would be when you have one joule for one second. In other words, you can put it into this triangle again to work out the, the relationship between power and energy. So if you had a 100 watt light bulb, it would be transferring 100 joules for every second it was used. It's going on to earthwise. You will see in all electrical devices, if they have got a metal case, 
there will be an earth wire connected to it, meaning the case is all connected to earth. The reason we do that is if there was a fault and the appliance touched, the case of the appliance touched the live, you, if you touch that, you will get electric shock. But because the earth wire is connected, any excess current will go uh, surge to earth and then the fuse will melt or commonly blow. So the fuse and the plug will melt, break off the circuit and protect it, mean that you won't actually get a shock. Most modern day appliances are called double insulated, meaning that there are no metal parts on the outside, which mean actually you don't need an earth wire. And finally, for hire only, you may be asked to consider charge. Now, charge is measured in coulombs. Charge is a concept of how many electrons are actually flown in a circuit. You can relate charge and current like this. Charge is current times time. You will be given the equation on the exam. And again, it's a case of rearranging it to find out what you want. So, but remember, charge is measured in something called coulombs. Again, named after a scientist, so it's a capital C. What is the motor effect? Well, you have, if you've got a magnetic field, a permanent magnet, and a wire, which is connected to a battery or some sort of power source, so you have a current through it, then you can get a force. So the idea is that a force will be produced when you have a current traveling through a magnetic field, but you must have the magnetic field and the current at angles to each other. If they are parallel, you will get no current. That's called a motor effect. In reality, an electric motor is a lot more complicated than that. It's basically a coil of wire, lots of coils of wire. More coils means more force. And it's designed such a way, you don't need to know the exact design, that one side will experience a force upwards and the other side will experience a force downwards. So you get a turning effect. And to get more powerful motors, you have more coils, a larger current, a larger magnetic field and a bigger area. The opposite to that, if you like, is electromagnetic induction, often called a generator effect. This time, instead of having a force, you move the wire, move a wire or conductor into a magnetic field. When you move it, Michael Faraday discovered this, that you generate an electric current. But when the wire is stationary, is stopped relative to the magnet, then you'll get no electric current. So moving the inner out of the magnetic field you get an induced current. The direction of the current can be reversed if you change the direction of the wire is moving and also if you change the direction of the magnetic field. To get a bigger current to generate more electricity, you increase the speed, you increase the magnetic strength and you increase the number of turns, have more, more than one turn of the coil and also the area of the coil. And this is how you make big generators to produce a lot of electricity. Here's the thing on the spec that you need to know. You need to know that to generate electricity, you must cut through electrical, uh, sorry, magnetic field lines. And if you cut through magnetic field lines, you will get a potential difference. The same thing will happen if you move the magnet in and out of the coil, so the coil stays stationary, but the magnet moves, and it's still cutting through the field. And if the wire is part of a complete circuit, then you'll get a current and generate your own electricity. This is how all power stations generate electricity, um, with the exception of solar power. They all make, turn a turbine to turn a big generator, which is a coil of wire and a magnet moving relative to each other. Um, this just shows you you can move the magnet in, in and outside of a coil. So if you, if, if you want to move the magnet in a coil and out of a coil, you get different directions of current, as shown in the diagram. So when it's moving in, it goes one way, when it's moving out, it goes the other way. There you go, it goes negative that way, positive as you move out. To increase the size of the current, you can increase the speed, increase the magnetic strength, and increase the number of coils, again, like in the slide. Actual generators are coils of wire which turn in a magnetic field, or magnets which turn in a coil of wire. And the faster you can turn that, the bigger the voltage. And you'll notice one thing about the voltage against the time, which is it is alternating. You produce an alternating current or an alternating voltage, which is what our mains electric. Work. The top here you have a step up transformer, and the bottom you have a step down transformer. And the difference is, is the number of turns on the primary and secondary. So a transformer is made of a primary coil, the first coil, and a secondary coil, the second coil. 
They are not electrically connected, but they are linked by an iron core. And it's the iron core which carries a magnetic field. You may be asked the question, why iron? It's because iron is a magnetic metal. There are only three magnetic metals. Iron is one of them, so it must be an iron core. And at the bottom here, you can see the number of turns is different. I'll show you that on the second slide. So if you just look, when I pass an alternating current through the primary, alternating current means it changes direction constantly, that produces an alternating magnetic field. That alternating magnetic field transfers through the iron core and it will then induce, by electromagnetic induction, a voltage on the secondary. Okay, and you can see that they're slightly... Okay, transformers are either step up or step down. So step up the voltage or step down the voltage. They only work an alternating current because an alternating current in the primary will generate a changing an alternating magnetic field to induce a current on the second. To work out the voltage, it steps up or step down, we use a transformer equation. This transformer equation will be printed on the exam. If you look on the right, the number of turns on the primary divided by the number of turns on the secondary will give you the ratio of the turns. And that is equal to the ratio of the voltage. So if you had the same number of turns on each, you get the same voltage on each. If it stepped up so the secondary had twice as many as the primary, then the voltage would have twice as many as the primary. I think the best way to explain this examples. So here's a conventional trauma. Let's just have a look. In the top here, you can see a, a step-down transformer has more turns on the primary than on the secondary, and a step-up has more turns on the secondary coil than on the primary. Let's put some numbers and see through a few examples. So this one here, you'd want to know how many coils were in the secondary. Well, if you're going from 240 volts to 480, then it's stepping up by a factor of 2. So the 100 coils must go up to 200, and therefore it's a step up transfer. Okay, another example. If you know there's 12 turns on the primary and 6 on the secondary, then it's going down by a factor of 2. So the voltage must also go down by a factor of 2, and therefore get 100 volts output, and therefore it's a step down. More examples. 7 turns to 14 will mean it goes up by a factor of 2, so it's 10 volts to 20. Step up. Okay, a final example here. If we go from 240 volts, which is our mains electricity, and you bring it down to 12 volts, so this could be an adapter for a, a mobile phone charger or something else electrical in your house, then the step down is 240 to 12 is 20 times. So it must have been 5 times 20, which is 100 turns on the primary. So it's 100 turns to 5, so it's a step down transformer. Why can transformers be used? Well, you may remember in P1 that you looked at the national grid. So here's a quick revision of the national grid. You start with some sort of power station, and you step up the voltage, you step up the volt transformer, and then you pass a high voltage across the national grid, and then when it gets to a substation near your house, it will step down to 230 volts for your home. Why do we do that? Well, we do it because we need to not lose so much power. So if electricity companies transmit at 230 volts, there will be a big power loss. This is because the current is too high. And therefore, to overcome this, use transformers to step up the voltage. Stepping up the voltage steps down the current, which means there's less current and therefore less power loss, which are much lower and therefore much more efficient system. Until 100 years ago, people thought that the atom was a bit like a pudding. They called it a plum pudding at the time. And it was made up, it's like a sphere, like a circle or a, a ball, with charges dotted around inside of it. And everybody thought this was a good model of what the atom actually looked like. Then came along in Rutherford, exactly 100 years ago, he did an experiment with a few assistants, and he discovered and shattered this structure of the atom and came up with a different one. This is what he did. He fired 
alpha particles out of thin gold leaf foil. So here's what he thought the gold leaf foil looked like, according to the plum pudding model. He got alpha particles, which are, and this is not a scale, are much, much smaller, and made up of two protons and two neutrons, and he bombarded the thin gold with the alpha particles, and he observed it. He observed thousands and thousands of these particles, and you can see as they go through, most of them actually go through the gold foil. They actually pass straight through. Then every now and again, you'll find that one of them might be deflected. So if you watch this one, it'll be deflected backwards. What does this mean? It means that the path of the alpha particles themselves look a little bit like this, where most of them go through the thin foil, and only one or two come back. In fact, what he concluded was only about one in 8,000 came back, bounced back, where really the plum pudding model, would you would expect them all to bounce back. A bit like firing tennis balls at a wall, you'd expect them all to bounce back off this solid. So the conclusion here, what Ernest Rutherford came up with, very important discovery, is that the atom is actually made up of small, positively charged nuclei, shown with here red dots, and the gap between them is mainly air, mainly not air, sorry, mainly space. So the alpha particles can actually just go straight through them because there's nothing to stop them. And he showed that these atoms, the nuclei of the atom is very, very small compared to the space between them because of them going through. So Rutherford came up with this structure of the atom, very much like the solar system, where in the middle you've got the nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons, so that's compared to like our sun, and around the outside, orbiting them, is the electrons. And the space between the electrons and the protons is massive, so it's a bit like our sun in the middle, with the planets orbiting around, you can imagine most of it is actually space. And this is the solar system model, if you like, of the atom that you'll be familiar with. So the atom is made up of protons, neutrons and electrons. Remember that protons, P standing for protons, is a positive charge and electrons are equal and opposite minus charge and neutrons have a neutral charge. And in terms of mass, the protons and neutrons carry all the mass and they have equal mass, so we call the relative mass one. An electron has such a small mass that we can consider that to be zero compared to protons and neutrons. We can represent atoms in a periodic table like this, where you've got the top is the mass number, so that's adding how many protons and how many neutrons there are. So in this case, four means that there are a total of four protons plus neutrons, so it's two of each. And the bottom number shows the proton number, so for helium, there are two. We know it's helium because the symbol HE is represented there. So there's two protons, so there must be two neutrons. Some atoms can exist in different forms. So for example here, we have oxygen. We have three different isotopes. Isotopes mean different types of the same element. We know it's oxygen because it has eight protons, but the mass can vary. So if you look at this, we can have a look at the different masses. So it's oxygen. Oxygen must have eight protons, otherwise it would be a different element. For this one, you can see that eight and eight would add up to 16. So there must be eight neutrons there to give a mass of 16. Whereas this isotope of oxygen has a mass of 17, it means it must have nine neutrons, because it's got nine protons, sorry, it's got eight protons, so nine plus eight is 17 mass. And this one finally would have 10 neutrons, so 10 and eight protons would add up to a mass of 18. So. These type of isotopes are also called radioisotopes. Radioisotopes means that they're radioactive, means that this oxygen and this oxygen isn't stable or as stable as this, so you'll get some sort of decay, radioactive decay. We get naturally occurring decay from all around us. About 50% of our background radiation, radiation in the background, is from radon gas, which is naturally occurring, and we get a small percentage from food because the food is grown in the ground, or animals eat the ground food, which have got radiation in the ground. We get a small percentage from cosmic rays and also from gamma rays from outer space, and we get an amount from medical and also from nuclear power. These two are the man-made ones, they're the ones that we actually make, but that only constitutes about 13%. In a whole, 
The most of it, or 50%, is radon gas, which comes from naturally occurring radioactive rocks in the ground. Three types of radiation. In detail, the first type of radiation you can have is called alpha. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet for A. An alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons, so it's the same as a helium nucleus. So if you look at this unstable nucleus, might break away two protons, two neutrons, so this new nucleus has two protons, two neutrons less, and therefore you get what's called an alpha particle. The second one, obviously the second letter of the alphabet, the Greek alphabet, is beta, and this is a bit more complicated. You can see that this neutron here can actually turn into a proton, so the neutrons are colored green, they're not really green, but just to represent here they are. It can turn into a proton. When that happens, an electron is emitted. And this electron is called a beta particle. So quite complicated. Beta is when it decays by changing a neutron into a proton. And then an electron flies off. This fast-moving electron is called a beta particle. And the third type, the third letter in the Greek alphabet uh, is gamma. Gamma is not a particle. Gamma is a wave, and this is what you get off when one of the others happens. So gamma is, after alpha, beta happens, you get a packet of energy, energy called gamma rays. Gamma rays, you'll remember, has the highest frequency with electromagnetic waves, and it gives a very short wavelength. And the atom is not changed when gamma rays come off because it's not a particle. The amount of energy we can get from the nucleus is massive. And there's two ways we can get energy from the nucleus. The first one is nuclear fission. Nuclear fission means to split the atom, to split the nucleus. And the way to do that is to bombard an atom, a very large atom, for example, uranium, with a neutron. So uranium or plutonium are the nuclear fuels that's used in the nuclear industry. Very large atoms that can be split. So if you bombard a nucleus of uranium with a neutron, what you'll see happen is the, the uranium will split in two. And when this happens, when it splits in two, you get a lot of energy off. And this energy is created and given off. Very, very large amount of energy. But what also happens is you get another three neutrons coming off. So you put one neutron in to split it, you've got the two new nuclei, which will be not uranium anymore, in this case, it's bearing and krypton, two new nuclei, but you get three more neutrons coming off. And remember, this gives a lot of energy. If you then follow that through those more neutrons, you get something called a chain reaction. A chain reaction, let me describe it here. So here's a neutron coming in. Neutron splits the atom in two, giving off a lot of energy and also giving off three new neutrons. Now, if those three neutrons go off to collide with three new uranium or plutonium nuclei, then you will get three more reactions, three more splitting of the nucleus, and there are three more reactions given off three times the energy. And if you follow the logic through there, we'll get another three, three, and three, so another nine neutrons, which can cause that. This is called a chain reaction, and this is how nuclear disasters can happen if it gets out of control, but it can give off so much energy. The other type of nuclear energy can be from fusion. So fission was about splitting the atom. Fusion is about joining or fusing nuclei together. This is what happens in the sun, in our sun and other stars. So this is what happens. Two protons can join together, quite complicated, but can join together with neutrons until you get a helium nucleus and again you get off a lot of energy and you've got this alpha particle here which which is a helium nucleus and two more protons which will go ahead to join together and form more helium so stars is a nuclear fusion reactor if you like where protons which are hydrogen is turned into helium when hydrogen is turned into helium this process nuclear fusion you get a lot of energy so our sun has been a nuclear fusion reactor for thousands and thousands of years giving us all this energy eventually the all of the hydrogen will turn into helium it will therefore run out of fuel and eventually die our sun is a star and it's one of billions of stars that orbit the center of the galaxy and our galaxy is called the Milky Way, 
And the Milky Way galaxy is one of billions of galaxies that orbit and move away from the centre of the universe. Our Sun and all other stars are formed from dust clouds which are pulled together under gravity and they are called protostars. As they move inwards, the gravitational potential energy is converted into heat and a protostar is formed. In the main sequence, which is what our Sun is doing now, um, there are two forces. The f gravitational force, as mentioned, which is pulling it inwards, pulling it together, and there's a radiation pressure which is act toward, acting outwards. These will balance up so the forces are equal, and when they're equal, the Sun or the star is stable. Stars are basically nuclear reactors. Hydrogen forms into helium, and that process is called nuclear fusion. When that happens, an enormous amount of energy is produced. And this will happen for millions of years. What happens eventually is that the fuel, the hydrogen, the helium, will run out. And when this happens, the star will begin to die or change. If it's, a ver if it's a very small star, for example, our sun is quite a small star, it will turn into a red giant. However, if it's much, much bigger, about four times bigger than our, star, our sun, it will turn into a red supergiant. So small stars turn into red giants, big stars turn into red supergiants. What then is another transformation is if for very, very small stars, the red giant will collapse under its own gravity, being pulled inwards, can become much smaller and turn into a white dwarf, and then eventually into a black dwarf as it runs out of energy. That's what happens with small stars. That's what will happen with our sun in millions of years to come. If it's a much, much bigger star than the star with a red giant, it will shrink, and then the enormous amount of energy it will explode. And that explosion is called a supernova. After a supernova explosion, what will happen is the remaining core turns into something called a neutron star. And if that neutron star is big enough, it will become a black hole. And black holes, as you probably guess, are black in terms of the light cannot escape from the gravity from within.